church, good morning. How's everybody doing? Doing all right. Happy Father's Day. I hope you know it's Father's Day at this point, right? Man, we love dads. This might be a crazy thing to say in our society today, but we love dads. We think dad's important. We think men are important. And being a dad, by the way, is very close to God's heart. If you didn't know this, maybe this is a new thought for some of you. God has always been a dad. Yeah, before he was a lawgiver, before he was a maker, before he was a judge, before he was a creator, he was a dad. Why? Well, because he's always had a son. He's always been in a relationship with Jesus. And so what an honor to be called the name dad. So listen, I've got a short sermon before a long sermon. Okay, so here's the short sermon up to dads. Uh, I want to take us to God's final word in the Old Testament. Maybe you've never been there. It's the prophet uh, Malachi. It'll be behind me in a moment. Um, but here's what it is. God has a final word to his people before he's quiet for 400 years. Now, our final word's important. Like if someone was dying and you went to visit them, you go to hospice or whatever, and they go, I want to tell you something. This is the last thing I want you to hear before I leave. It's like you would lean in, you would listen, and they would think a lot about what they're going to say. In the same way, I want to, you're going to be surprised with this if you've never seen this. I want you to see what God's final word is. It's a word to dads. Look at this. Malachi chapter four, here it is, verse five. Behold, what does behold mean? It means listen. It means stop whatever you're doing and look. Behold, I will send you Elijah. We talked about him last week, okay, he's a prophet. The prophet, before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. So he's, here's my final word, here it is, verse six. And he, that's God, he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. Dad, here's what you need to know. I know Father's Day's for you and you're gonna go to lunch and you're gonna do a bunch of fun things, but here's a word to you dads. What do your kids need from you? I don't know, whether they're five or they're 15 or they're 50, what do they need from you? Here's the answer from scripture. They need your heart. I know, you know, you wanna provide for them and you wanna protect them and okay, those are good things. Provide physically and spiritually, protect physically and spiritually, but don't forget, pursue. What your kids need is your affection and your attention. Now listen, I'm gonna be, at the end of the summer, I'm turning 38. And every time I still see my dad, which is only four or five, six times a year, every time I see him, he gives me a hug and he gives me a kiss. And guess what? I love it, okay? And if you've got a kid, and I don't care if he's 12 or 13 or 14, and you hug him and you kiss him, and if he, if he says, dad, stop it, here's what that means. Dad, keep doing it, please. That's what that actually means. They love it. Look, and here's what it says, that dad's hearts need to be toward their kids. It says that God does this work. It's a magical work that God does in the heart of a man where a man begins to love and care for his kids. That's the work of Christ in a man's life. And then it says when a a father loves his kids, it says their hearts turn back to him. And then do you see what it says at the end of the verse? If this does not happen, the Bible says there's utter destruction. That what what happens is if dads don't love their kids, the nation, the church, the city is doomed. And I'm going to make a theological statement, not a political statement. We lived in a cursed nation because we live in a fatherless nation. We live in a cursed nation because one out of four kids goes to bed tonight with no dad in the home. And so here's what I wanna say to dads. Dads, we said at the beginning, you are unbelievably important. What we wanna do as a church is we wanna come alongside you. We wanna encourage you. It's hard to be a dad today. It's hard to be a dad in 2022. It's like running into a stiff headwind. So what we wanna do is we wanna honor dads. So if you're a dad, stand up. You need some exercise anyway. Come on, get, get on up, guys. Yes, dads. Look at this, I love it. Guys, guess what is the, statistically speaking, stand, keep standing, keep standing, I'm gonna pray for you, sorry, I should say that. Listen, statistically speaking, the least likely Sunday for dad to show up to church is guess what day? Today. Because it's Father's Day, so dad wants to golf, and dad wants to go to the lake, and dad wants to watch football, and dad doesn't wanna be in church. Thank you, men, for being in church. When dad loves Christ, when dad connects his family to the church, it changes everything for the entire family. If this is your husband or you know, this is your dad, you can put your hand on him if you want. We're gonna pray for these men. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for these men. Lord, I thank you that they are dads. I, th- I pray that, I don't know where they are with all this. Lord, I pray that no matter what's happened, no matter where their kids are, that you would turn their hearts to their children. Maybe some of them as soon as, even while I'm preaching, they need to send a text message. They need to make a phone call this afternoon. Lord, I pray that you would, no matter where, some of them, they say, I love my kids. My kid's heart isn't toward me. Lord, we pray for dads who on this day, they're brokenhearted, Lord. We pray for dads who feel like their dad never had the heart toward them. Lord, we pray for dads who have father wounds, Lord, that you would heal them. And part of the way that you heal a father wound is when when a man becomes a father and he begins to love and invest the next generation. So I pray these men would know that they are loved. They're loved by their wives. They're loved by their kids. They're loved by you and they're loved by this church. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. 
All right, we got a lot to cover, guys. Uh, open up to 1 Samuel uh, 16. If you don't know this, uh, we think in terms of not Sundays and sermons, although I love both, but we think in terms of series. We're in a brand new series, and we gave you stuff. That when you came in, some of you, if you're under 30, you won't know what this is. This is a bookmark. Have you seen? <laughs> there used to be these things called books, and it, they're not on devices. Uh, you know. Anyway, um, this is a bookmark. It's, it, listen, what we want to connect you to, and it's really your decision whether you're going to do this or not, but the reason that you connect yourself to a church is so that we can help you. We can give you the resources and the relationships that you need. So when we say, you know, get in a community group and go through the weekender and get in a serving team, that's all about relationships. And then there's resources. And so we gave you this, and look, it's First Chronicles 10 to 29. Why is that? Well, I can't go through the whole life of David in seven weeks. We're going to hit some, some mountaintops, okay, and some valleys in his life, and that's about it. If it was 17 weeks, I probably couldn't get it through it all. We'd probably need almost 70 weeks to get through it all. Uh, but what you'll do is if you read First Chronicles, it's a, it's a second account of the life of David. You might go, why do we start in chapter 10? Well, chapters 1 through 9 is just a bunch of Hebrew names. And so you open up, you're going to go, why is the Hebrew phone book in my, <laughs> in my Bible? That's what it is. But starting in chapter 10, you're going to be introduced, uh, and you're going to get to know David and see his life unfold. And so anyway, and on the back is a method to help you study the Bible. So that's for you. Okay, so we're in the series. Why do we call it David? Well, it's all about David. That's what the next you know, seven weeks are going to be about. He's super famous. Obviously, you've heard of him. I mean, whether you're a Christian, grew up in the church or not, almost everybody's heard of King David. And no one is, no name is mentioned more in the Bible than David. Nope, not even Abraham. Nope, not Moses. I mean, he's the most mentioned person. He shows up in 66 chapters of the Bible, and his name is mentioned over 1,000 times. So that's a lot of times, okay? And he was a Renaissance man. I know he lived before the Renaissance, but you know what I mean, okay? He was a Renaissance man. He was a, a poet. He was a musician. Uh, he was a theologian. He wrote scripture. Uh, he was a warrior. He fought many battles. We'll see next week he fights Goliath. He was a warrior. He was a king. He was a shepherd. Uh, and, then he, and then he had just all the identities that we all have, right? It's like, well, you know, he was a son. He was a father. And so what we're going to do over the next seven weeks just to prepare you is we're going to look at David and see, really, yes, he's a king, but he's actually more the same than us than he is different from us. So we're going to see him as a sinner. We're going to see him as a friend. We're going to see him as a father. We're going to see him as a, as a person who needs to fight battles. So that's where we're going to go. And, and this, by the way, you're kind of, it's helpful to know context. Uh, this was written 3,000 years ago, what we're about to read. Yes, before air conditioning. Unbelievable, yeah. Yes, before the car. Yes, before you could get on a plane and travel to the other side of the na nation in five hours. But what you, what you see is, and this is because the Bible is timeless, it's always timely. And so as we read the Bible, we're like, wait a second, the human condition hasn't changed. And so I think it's going to deeply speak to us. So, okay, that's all introduction. Let's turn to 1 Samuel 16. I've got to do a little bit of background work today, guys. We won't do this every week, but we're jumping right in the middle of a book. If you're new with us, what we normally do is we, we open up a book. We're like, okay, Philippians 1, and then we, you know, 2, and then 3, and then 4, and then we're done. Uh, but we're jump, because we're going to study the life of David, we're parachuting in to the middle of this book. Uh, we're about jumping in halfway through the book. And so I've got to introduce you to three characters. And we're mostly going to talk about David in this series, but you have to understand Saul and Samuel to understand David. They're all in the first verse. Here, here's the first time they're all three mentioned in the same verse in the book. So it's a great place to start. All right, now the Lord. Do you see this in verse one, the Lord? And in the ESV, that's the translation we read. If it says Lord, it means uh, it's his God's covenant name. It's literally, it's all caps. It's Yahweh. So it says, the Lord said to Samuel, so we'll talk about him in a second, okay? Samuel is a great prophet. He was a great leader. He was a judge. And he, played a, he plays a unique role in the book of First and Second Samuel. The book gets named after him. It says this, the Lord said to Samuel, how long will you grieve over Saul? We're gonna have to talk about Saul and it is a sad story. I'll tell you about that in a second. But Saul was the first king in Israel. See, David is the second king, but Saul was the first king. How long will you grieve over Saul since I have rejected him? We'll talk about why he got rejected from being king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil. So some of you thought that verse last week on oil was random. Here it is again. <laughs> Another verse on oil. Uh, Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite. For I have provided for myself a king among his sons. So that's David. So here's what I want to talk about today. I want to, I want to talk about an idea. And I first heard this idea uh, articulated by a guy named R.T. Kendall. He's a pastor in his 90s now. But he said, if you look at this passage, what you see is yesterday's man today's man, and tomorrow's man. And I just want you to get ready because at the end of the service, I'm gonna ask, who are you? What we see is Samuel is today's man. We're gonna talk about him. Saul is yesterday's man. And David is tomorrow's man. Let's first talk about Samuel. You see Samuel, we gotta, we gotta talk about him for a minute. You know, he doesn't just appear on the script, uh, pages of scripture. He has a mom. Do you remember her name? It's Hannah. Hannah can't get pregnant. That happens to women. One out of three women over 30 can't get pregnant than they want to. And she's heartbroken and she's crying about it. 
She's making promises to God. And she basically says, God, if you give me this kid, then I'm going to dedicate him to the Lord. I'm giving you the real short version. She has this miraculous kid, really, and, and, and um, his name, she names him Samuel, and she gives him basically unto the Lord and gives him to Eli and says, Eli, will you disciple this kid? And so Eli, this great man, he begins to disciple Samuel. And there's one night where Samuel is a little boy. We don't know how old, and, and he keeps hearing these voices, when, you know, and he's going, going to Eli and saying, I'm hearing something. And Eli goes, it, it's not me. He says, next time you hear the voice, here's what I want you to say. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So that's the beginning, by the way, of Samuel becoming today's man. What is the man of God or the woman of God that God uses today? It's the person that says this, speak, Lord, I'm still listening. Guess what the first thing, this is amazing, the first thing God says to Samuel, Samuel, I'm doing something new. The problem with yesterday's man is he's not paying attention to what God's doing today. Henry Blackaby, who wrote Experiencing God, he said the role of the Christian is to find out what is God up to. Where is God working? Among who is God working? And I want to show up and be part of that. So he's today's man. This is, this is what Samuel is. And today's man is often a transitional person. Like we're going to see, he anoints the first king. He, he actually, what, what, what he basically does is he brings Saul up into being a king. So here's what happened. I know there's a lot of background today, but, but it's important to understand this whole story. Um, so you've got, you've got Saul. And uh, what happens actually before Saul is the nation of Israel, they had prophets and they had priests, human prophets, human priests but they had God was their king. And then they looked around like Christians often do. We look around at the world and we go, well, they're doing it differently. And so they go to, they go to you know, God and basically say, well, they go to Samuel, really. And they say, we want a king. And God talk, or Samuel talks to God and God's like, listen, you don't want a king. You don't want a human king because he's going to sleep with your wives. He's going to send your kids to war. He's going to tax you. He's like, no, no, we want a king. We want a king. God's like, okay, fine. I'll give you a king then. And so he gives him a king. And what he ends up giving him is Saul. And, and Saul at first, if you read, I think it's chapters nine and 10, Saul's a great guy for two chapters. Saul is today's man for two chapters. Some of you used to be today's man. You were today's man in high school. You were today's man in college. Saul got to be today's man for two chapters, and then he lost it. I want to encourage you in this, because this means it can change. How do you become yesterday's man? It's always a choice, always. It's a choice of consistent compromise. And I don't have the time to unpack all of Saul's story, but man, is it a sad story. Do you know Saul's one of the only people we don't know if he's in heaven or not? Theologians debate. It's like there's certain people, it's like, no, they didn't believe. There's certain people, it's like they clearly believe. There's certain people, they had a hard times, then they came back. It's like, man, it does not end well for Saul. Saul's a great reminder to us that the last day is more important than the first day. And how we finish is more important than how we start. And so you've got Saul, and it's really a heartbreaking story. And then you've got, you've got David. Now, here's the interesting thing about David. David is, we're going to meet David in like, depending on the Jewish tradition that you read, it's like he's somewhere between 10 and 18 years old. I mean, he's young. He's either graduating from our kids' ministry or he's in our middle school ministry or he's in our high school ministry at the oldest. And so what we're going to see today is we are going to see Saul become yesterday's man. You heard that, for I have rejected him. What's interesting about Saul, by the way, also, is he still ends up being king for 20 more years. He doesn't realize he's lost the blessing and anointing of God in his life. And David is going to be anointed at the end of this chapter. He's going to be anointed the, you know, the next king, but he won't become king for 20 or 25 more years. He still has a lot of hard things. By the way, if you're tomorrow's man, here's what you need to realize. You will one day be who you are now becoming. And that what your life is, and you understand this the older you get, your life is the culmination of all the decisions that you have decided to make. Your life is the culmination of how you have decided to react and respond to everything that happens to you. And so what I want us to see today is here's, here's our hope in our church. This is what we want to be. We say it a lot of different ways, but if I said it from this verse, we want to be a church where today's men and women invest in tomorrow's men and women. Why do we have a kid's ministry? Why do we have a student ministry? Why do we have a college ministry? Why do we have a residency? Because that's what we're doing. Okay, so let's pick this up. We're going to follow first today's man. Here's today's man. Remember, verse one. The Lord said to Samuel, how long will you grieve over Saul? For I have rejected him. Uh, rejected him. Today's man knows when it is time to move on. I've rejected him from being king of Israel. Fill your horn with oil and I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite. For I have provided for myself a king among his sons. Then if you look in verse two, here's what it says. And Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. So if you're gonna be today's man, you need to obey what God has said even when you're afraid. This is gonna be a breakthrough moment for, for Samuel, right? He's afraid. It's like, well, would you be afraid? It's like, probably you'd be afraid. 
Okay, I want you to anoint another king. Well, actually, Saul's not a good guy. He's, a, he's actually an ungodly guy, and he's in power. And if I do this, it'll probably start a civil war. And uh, sa- uh, therefore, Saul will probably kill me. So Samuel's afraid. Let me ask you this question. What are you afraid to do that you know you need to do? You know, you don't want to say it out loud. Maybe it's confess the sin. We talked about that last week. It's like, well, you're still struggling with the same thing in the exact same way. You know you are. And here's how you know you are, because every time after you do it, you say you're going to tell somebody, and you don't. Or you do, Lord, next time, if I do it again, then I'm going to tell somebody. It's like, well, listen, if you could get yourself out of this, you would have gotten yourself out of it already. So you need to tell somebody. It's like, you don't need to tell everybody. You need to tell somebody. Well, that takes courage. It's like, well, I know the Bible says confess sins, but I'm afraid to do it. Well, today's men and women say, you know what? I'm going to obey even when I'm afraid, and I'm going to trust God with the results. Some of you are afraid to be generous, and there's lots of reasons why people aren't generous. I mean, you know, some people are just stingy, okay? It's like, you know, they're just, they're worried about everything, and they're they're saving, and they're just, they're all about themselves. What I have found is actually the reason that most people don't give is not that they're stingy, it's that they're scared. If you ever talk to people about this, and it's a care conversation, that's what you get. You get some version of like, well, I just, when they're really honest, I just don't know what I would do with 10% less income. Okay, well, now I'm talking to the real you. But you're thinking, you're not thinking God's economy, you're thinking of your economy, you're not thinking about the principle of blessing that if you put God first in it, God blesses it. Okay, here's a, here's a big one for many of you. Some of you are afraid to have the difficult conversations that you need to have. I mean, the amount of men that are afraid of their wives. I mean, some of you would laugh, but you're like, she's right next to me, I can't laugh. <laughs> I mean, you're right, it's like a meme, it's like a joke. It's the men who are afraid of their wives. I was talking to this guy, he leads these man camps. They're literally called man camps. He goes, oh, it's, they only do them in the winter. <laughs> like, that sounds terrible. Then, then I asked him more about it. He's like, oh yeah, it's, it's full out camping. I was like, that sounds worse. And then he's like, and there's no toilets. I'm like, no thank you is my answer to that. <laughs> but what he said is he does, and he'll get three, he'll do a couple of these. He'll get three, 400 guys to show up for two or three nights in the winter to camp outside. And I'm like, man, what? Because he's really having an influence on men. I said, what are you doing? He says, when men come to my man camp, he said they do hard things often for the first time in their life. And then something happens inside of them and they say, I'm the kind of person who can do hard things. So now I need to go back home and I need to have the hard conversations I've never had. Some of you are afraid to talk to your kids, right? You'd be surprised, or maybe you wouldn't be surprised how many people are afraid of their teenage daughter. It's like, you know you are. It's like, you know, she's doing some terrible things and I know if you talk to her, she'll cry, I know. You know, or, there's, or your teenage son who's aloof and he spends way too much time on his devices and you're pretty sure he's looking at pornography and you don't like his friends, but you don't want to say anything. It's like, you need to say something. So we need to courageously take our next step forward. It's like, well, this is what God has said. Yes, I'm afraid. So here's what he does. This is really important. He says, God, will you help me? Isn't that powerful? God, help me. How can this be possible? I want you to know that I dedicate at least 25% of my sermons to how can I, how can I help you? to the how. It's like, do you want to read your Bible? We just gave you how. It's on the back. Do you want to forgive? I'll help you know how to do it scripturally. Do you want to reconcile? We'll talk about how to do it. Do you want to do it? I can't help you if you don't say, Lord, I want help. So basically he says, God, I'm gonna, I want to obey you. This is a big moment. Will you help me? And God says, I love to help you. He says, here's what you're going to do. You're going to put it all in an environment of worship. He says, we're going to go down and worship. You don't have to tell everybody everything. Go take the Jesse and his sons down. And when you take them down to worship, then you'll anoint the new king. And, and by the way, and Saul says, or, or Samuel says, I can do that. See, God gives you one step at a time, right? What does the Bible say about the word of God? It is a lamp to our feet. It doesn't say it's a high beam, right? We, we can't put our high beams on. It's a lamp. I get one step. I obey it. It's the dimmer switch principle. And then more lights turned on. Oh, now I understand a little bit more. I've obeyed, so now I understand. So now I've taken that step, so now I can take the next step. Well, look what happens in verse 3. In verse three, he says this, and invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me him whom I declare to you. So he doesn't give him any more information. I need you to go down. It's gonna be one of Jesse's sons. Verse four, so Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem and the elders of the city came to meet him trembling and said, do you come peaceably? Now, why did they ask that? Well, if you go back to chapter 15, the last thing Samuel does is he deals with something that Saul wouldn't deal with. God had told Saul, hey, I need you to go kill this pagan king, and Saul doesn't do it, so Samuel goes, and it literally says he chops him into pieces. Yikes. So Samuel's not a guy you mess around with, so when he shows up, you're like, uh, are you friendly? <laughs> and his answer is, thankfully, he says, he, look, he says in verse five, and he said, peaceably, 
I've come to sacrifice for the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice and consecrate Jesse and his sons and invite them to the sacrifice. So there they go down, verse six. When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. So here's what happens. I mean, you can imagine this. It, you know, God tells Samuel, I want you to go down. Jesse's got some sons. One of them is going to be the next king. Now you could imagine if in this room I just said, hey guys, you know, today I want to announce that somebody in here is going to be the next president of the United States. You would look around at certain people, you go, nope, not. <laughs> Definitely not him, you know. And you look at other people and go, well, probably him. And, and why would you do that? Well, maybe you don't even know them. Maybe, you just, it's, maybe it's just how they look, right? He's talking about appearances. In fact, look, I'll show you this. In verse 7, it says this. This is maybe one of the most famous verses in the life of David. The Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance. So he must have been good looking or tall or strong or attractive or in the height of his stature because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Here's what he's saying, that you'll meet a lot of people and they look the part, but they don't have the heart. Right? I mean, some of you know, wait, and, and this, is, this is the whole temptation to just judge people on, I don't know, on status, on how good looking they are, on the car they drive, on the neighborhood they live in, on the clothes they wear, right? I'm tempted to this. Every time I've gone to the village juice shop, anyone ever been there? It's like everybody's the same there. It's like, let me guess, you're coming from working out, okay? You're wearing Lululemon, mm-hmm. You're, wear, you're willing to spend $15 on an eight ounce juice drink. Who are you? Like, what do you do? What world do you live in, right? Or you ever, you know, I was in California this week at a conference and so every time this happens, you know, every time I fly, you know, I'm always walking into first class, never sitting there, but walking past it. Um, <laughs> and, and I'm always looking around and I see all these people. And do you ever have this thought? You're like, what do you do? They're all like sitting there comfortably drinking their drinks. You're like, it's like $500 more each way to sit in that seat. We're, we're, just, we're just overwhelmed by status. The cars people drive, the credentials that people have. It's, it's, the, it's the temptation to emphasize the external man over the inner man, to emphasize appearance over heart. Now, now at first, appearance is all we have. Right? So we have to make some judgments based on how you look and how you, you know, when we know that, we know that this is what happens. Taller men get jobs more like, are more likely to get the job. Prettier women are more likely to get the job. <sighs> Neil Postman writes about this. He, he wrote a book called Amusing Ourselves to Death. I think he wrote it in the 80s, and he was talking about the difference between radio and TV. Imagine if he wrote it today. It's like internet, streaming services, social media. And he says, we live in the age of the image over the idea. So here's an interesting thing that happened. When Nixon and JFK debated one another, those who listened to it on the radio thought Nixon won. And those who watched on television thought JFK won. Because Nixon made more compelling arguments, but JFK looked better. He was buttoned up, he knew how to smile, he knew how to inter interact with people. Th this is unbelievably hard on us, to live in the, a the time where there's so much that's expected from appearance. I I'm gonna show you an interesting picture. This is a picture of Sex in the City and, uh, and I think the other show, if you put up there, and this is the other one I believe is called Golden Girls. Okay, <laughs> Sarah Jessica Parker in the middle is the same age as the three women, not the blue lady in the blue. You're like, you're lying. <laughs> no. Uh, so that's what the expectations, on the right, that was the expectation of what a lady, lady in her mid to late 50s should look like. And then there's Sarah Jessica Parker. All right, you can take the picture down. I mean, we live in a, can, that's just in one generation the expectations of how thin you should be, what your hair should look like, how you should dress, it's all changed. And so here's what he's saying, God cares about the inner man. This is such a big theme. God cares about your heart. Now what, what is your heart? The heart is, here's the best way to think of the heart. The heart is the real you. Not the, not the fake you, not the you you pretend to be, not the persona, the simplified self you put together as you interact with us. Not the, certainly not the you at church probably. And definitely not the you on social media. Like a couple years ago, actually more, I wasn't the pastor here yet when this happened, but I remember one of Margaret and I, our friends, uh, she called us up and she's crying on the phone because she thinks her husband's gonna divorce her and her husband's gonna leave her and he's sharing, she's sharing all these horrible things about their marriage. I'm like, oh my gosh. And I remember my first thought was, 
all I ever see is pictures of y'all hugging and kissing and eating out on social media. Oh, that's fake you. Fake you is doing fine. Real you is in trouble. Real you has a tough marriage. It was, a, it was a moment for me. I'm like, wow, this is people. People really do live completely different lines, lives online. Often the people who post the most, like the lovey dovey, lovey dovey, lovey stuff, that's like, no. And what I've seen is the people who look like their lives are together every once in a while. I mean, I, I, I'm normal, I think. I want a normal person. I, I'm impressed by certain people. It's like, wow. And then you get to know them. You're like, oh, their life is a mess. And they've learned how to get one dimension of their life looking good their dress and their looks, you know and everything else, and their marriages, their kids hate them, and their finances are a wreck, and their, you know, their marriage is on the rocks, and they drink too much. It's like, you know, it's just, and here's a good question to ask, by the way, is do the people who know you best love you most? That's a real you question, right? I mean, this is the only industry, the only industry I know is the church industry, if we call it an industry, it pastors, okay? Whatever. So I'll just tell you a story that I know how this works in the pastor world. I'm not saying every pastor who does this is doing it for this reason, but why do pastors leave local churches to do conference speaking, consulting, and coaching? Well, number one, there's a lot more money in it, okay? Number two, you don't have to be known. Can I fly on this plane and can I show up and I, can I give my two or three sugar stick messages? Can I come in for two days and can you put me in a hotel and take me out to dinner? And can I just tell you a couple things I know about the church? And you don't need to get to know me. When you're a pastor, it's like, well, you're known by the people and yes, I coach the, you know, this team for my kids and yes, I'm in the, you know, you know, yes, I'm around, and yes, I'm, you know, you'll see me at the grocery store, and it's, it's, that, it's that kind of like, the, who is the real you? So the, the question is, are, are, you know, if I, if I, whenever I say to you, you know, you know the right answer, right? You don't even have to be a Christian. You know the right answer. If I said, is the inner person more important than the outer person? You'd go, oh, yeah. Is the, is the heart more important than appearance? You'd go, oh, yeah. Is, is character more important than competency? Oh, yeah. But then let me ask you this. I mean, how much time do you spend cultivating your heart? You know, it's like we spent, we've got, you know, some of you, you've got lotions and you've got perfumes and you've got hair product and you eat kale, you know, <laughs> and you, you know, and you work out every day and you spend lots of time in front of the mirror and it's like, you know, and, and fair enough, you know, and it's like you care so much about it. We don't spend any time in front of God's word, the mirror of God's word. The, the only way I know how to cultivate the heart, well, there's a couple ways, but the main, one of the main ways is the spiritual disciplines. Lord, I'm, I'm praying, I'm being honest, I'm confessing my sin. I'm searching the scriptures. I'm asking you to change me. I'm reading my Bible. I'm memorizing it. It's the spiritual disciplines. Well, here's, what he, here's, what he wants, here's the encouraging and maybe terrifying word. Here's what he's saying. God knows your heart. God knows the real you. So for some of you, you just need to hear that because it's like, you know, I don't know. We're all in different places in this room. Some of you just need to hear God sees your heart because you're like, I'm trying. Like nobody knows. Like I am praying about this. And I'm dealing with some stuff in my life and I'm trying to love God and I'm trying to love others and I feel like nobody sees it. It's like, well, the encouraging word to you is that God sees your heart. Other people need, you just need a warning. God sees your heart. You're like, you ain't getting away with nothing. I know you can fool some people all the time and all people some of the time, but you can't fool God any of the time. And that's what matters ultimately. And so here's what's gonna happen now. We're gonna see David come on the scene. If you look at me at verse eight, here's what it says. Then Jesse called Abinadab, so that's his oldest or second oldest son, and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. And then Jesse made Shammah pass by, and he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. And Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, and Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen these. Then Samuel said to Jesse, are all your sons here? Because think about it. It's like, all right, God's not lying. He told me what to do. I come down here. He says, go down, get Jesse's sons. You're gonna, I'm gonna tell you which one's king. I come down, I get Jesse's sons, and you tell me none of them are king. This means someone's not here. So look what he says. And he said, so, so uh, then Samuel said to Jesse, are all your sons here? And he, this is Jesse, said, there remains yet the youngest, but behold, he's keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and get him, for we will not sit down till he comes here. I can't stress enough that the first time David's mentioned, he's forgotten. Do you notice this? It's a weird thing on Father's Day, but actually Jesse's a terrible father. He's a counter vision. And I can show you, he does at least four things in the passage that tell you he's a terrible dad. And he's got some dysfunctional relationship with his youngest son. We don't know all the details of it. The first is when he's told to get all his sons, he gets all of his sons except David. All of them. 
You know, it's not, it's not like, I mean, this, this is, a, you got to understand this. It's not like he grabs his two oldest and says, well, maybe it's probably going to be the firstborn or secondborn. It's not that he grabs four of the eight and says, well, these are my four best. He grabs everybody but David. Then the second thing is, okay, so after all the sons walk by, okay, that's over. It's like, you think, you'd think a good dad might go, okay, you know, I forgot one. I should go get him. I didn't, you know. So, no, he doesn't even say, I've got another son. He has to be asked by Samuel. Samuel says, is this all your sons? And then, this is really sad, he doesn't even name David by name. He says, there remains one, the youngest, literally in the Hebrew, the least. Least, Jesse, least in your affections? Least in your esteem? What do you mean least? And then it appears that he doesn't even want to go get him. Because Samuel has to stand up and go, I'm not, I mean, Samuel is the first person to honor David. That's part of what today's man does. He honors the next generation. He honors those who've been forgotten. And Samuel, the great prophet, says, I'm not sitting down until David gets here, so somebody go get him. Now, I have to talk about this for a minute because in a room this size, online and lobby and all that, like, I would imagine some of you just feel forgotten and invisible. It's just like, it's a terrible feeling. You're just like, you know, it could be at work. It's like I'm overlooked constantly. I'm overlooked by my own coworkers. I'm certainly overlooked by my boss. Does anybody even notice what I'm doing? People feel overlooked all the time by their parents sometimes. This is why one of the main teachings in the book of Genesis is don't play favoritism, right? You'll meet women every once in a while. It's like, well, I was the less pretty, you know, daughter, unfortunately. It's not my fault, but it's like I didn't get the same affection and attention from mom and dad. Or, you know, you meet a son every once in a while and his life's a wreck and you're like, what happened? And you're like, dude, I'm the, I'm the mess up in the family. You know, I couldn't, you know, it's like I couldn't do academics and I couldn't do athletics and so I'm just kind of the mess up. You'll meet a lot of wives over time who feel completely forgotten and invisible to their spouse. It's like we go out and he talks about the business and never talks about me and he tells stories and forgets that I'm in there and like, I feel like I'm, it's like, do I even need to be here? And the message from scripture on the authority of God's word is that those who are forgotten and invisible to the world are remembered and seen by God. That's what it says. And so now we're gonna actually see David. David's going to come, and again, he's a teenager. But where do they have to go to get him? They have to go get him, he's a shepherd. Like this is a not respected blue collar job in that society. And here's another rem reminder, it, like, David is not doing something great when we first meet him, right? Where you start is not necessarily where you're going to stay, okay? And I think about my own life. I'm not saying I'm anyone great or I'm doing anything great, but I certainly didn't wake up doing this. I mean, I, I started out, I was a paper boy, you know? And then I, then I worked at McDonald's all through high school. And then I finally got promoted and I went over Pizza Hut. <laughs> True story. <laughs> and then when I, my freshman year of college, my dad said to me, you know, hey, I got a great job. This is 20 years ago. I got a great job for you. It's gonna make $20, you're gonna make $10 an hour. This was 20 years ago. I thought, wow, my dad forgot to tell me it's a 4 p.m. to midnight job and it's inside of a fridge. So I worked inside of a fridge all summer long. But by the way, God used that. You never know how God's preparing you. The, the, the thing is, we wanna, be, we wanna be King David in 25 years from wh what's happening right now. We wanna be King David reigning. It reminds me, there's an older pastor, he's in his 70s, and he's conference speaker, book writer, well-known, and he says every once in a while, young guys will come up to him and they'll go, I want to do what you do. And he's a real funny guy, and he says, what I say to them is, do you want to do what I did? <laughs> he says, people want to do what you do, but they don't want to did what you did. And, and so this is the whole idea. So here's what, here's what he's doing. He's doing something that he could think, David's doing something that could be used, that could be thought of as punishment, but that is actually preparation. It, it's a trying time but it's also a training time. I don't know what in your life you might look as, as punishment, but it actually might be preparation for something next. So let's look at David. What is David? Okay, let's, let's give three things. First, he's a shepherd. It's like, well, he's probably walking around. He's a teenager. What am I doing with my life? It's me alone with all these sheep all day. All I do is I lead them and I feed them and I know them and I protect them and I take care of them. It's like, well, actually, we're gonna need you to lead, feed, know, and protect God's people. So this will be good training for you. But he doesn't know that. It's like, that, that's, that's, you don't know, you can't understand God's will for your life looking through the windshield. You talk to anybody, it's like, how do I know God's will for my life? I understand it when I see it in the rearview mirror. That's why that happened to me. That's why I had the parents that I had. That's why I had the experience. That's why I have the personality that I have. God gave me a uniquely loud voice. <laughs> I just was born with that. I, I talk too loud all the time. 
now I'm a preacher. Here it is. Um, so there's, there's, so he's, he's got a shepherd. How about the second thing he's got? He's got a slingshot. He's probably out with his, I mean, I'm, I'm taking some liberty in talking about this, but I think it's not far from the truth. He's probably out with all his sheep, and he knows, where did he learn? We'll see next week he knows how to shoot a slingshot. So he gets pretty good at, with, uh, with his hobby. He's probably like, what good is this going to be? It's like, well, wait till next chapter. Because when you meet Goliath, it's going to be really good that you know how to do this. And some of you go, well, what is this goofy hobby? Why, I'm good at this. I'm good with technology. What is, what, I've got all these hobbies and these desires. What are they going to be used for? Or how about, he's probably, while he's out there, he's writing a lot of songs. Well, no one will ever hear these. What are, these are just songs I wrote for myself. It's like, actually, no, you'll become the most famous singer-songwriter ever. And your songs are going to encourage and comfort the church for 3,000 years. What is God using right now in your life to prepare you? Well, you don't fully know. We don't know until we get there and we go, oh, that's how God prepared me. Let me give you a couple things God tends to use. Your parents, obviously. You know, and some of you have great parents and so they end up being a vision and then some of you have terrible parents and so they end up being a counter vision, which is a terrible thing to say out loud. But it's like I just, you know, sometimes you're just like I had the experience and I don't want to be my dad, which is horrible to say. But people get there. I don't want, here's another terrible thing to say, I don't want my parents' marriage. But God uses things. God will often use your suffering. We've said here for years that your greatest ministry is going to come out of either your greatest suffering or your greatest sin struggle where you're now obeying God. Because suffering people want to be ministered to by people who've suffered. And people who are struggling with sins want to be ministered to by people who have had that same sin struggle and come out the other side. And so we meet David as a teenager, as a shepherd boy long before he's going to become a shepherd king. By the way, this is why we care so much about investing in the next generation here. Like this week, I feel remiss if I didn't say this, this week we've got over 30 students from our high school ministry. They're in Mississippi doing a mission trip. We got over 30 students from our middle school ministry. They're doing another mission trip in Kentucky. Some of the high schoolers are coming back and in two weeks they're going to Mexico. And then 40 of our students are going to a student ministry retreat uh, this summer. It was like, why? It's like, because we genuinely believe in investing in the next generation. So finally, David comes. Look at verse 12. Verse 12, we, we get David. Here's what it says. And he sent and brought him in, and he was ruddy. Now, that's a hard word to translate. It can either mean dirty, it can mean freckled, or it can mean he has red hair, which is a great encouragement. God can even use redheads. This is a great, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> it's a great encouragement. No, he sent him in, and he was ruddy. Look at this, and he had beautiful eyes and handsome. It doesn't say, and he was the sorriest looking fellow I'd ever seen, you know? It's not that he had no gifts, it was that he had a, the heart was more important than the gifts. He had gifts, he was a good looking guy. He had beautiful eyes, it says. It says this, and the Lord said, arise and anoint him, for this is he. You, you have to understand, I mean, one of the main points of this entire passage is, is that God picks the people everybody else forgets. God picks, I mean, God, there's no perfect people. David, we're going to see he's a big sinner. He's going to be an adulterer. He's going to be a liar. He's going to be a murderer. He's not a perfect person. And God, everybody that God picks, there are no perfect people. So he just picks who, whoever he wants to use. It's like, was Noah perfect? No, he got drunk as soon as he got off the ark. You're like, well, maybe Abraham. No, Abraham was a liar and he put his wife in danger. You're like, well, okay, ha ha, Jacob. No, Jacob was also a liar and had a terrible relationship with his brother. Well, what about Moses? No, Moses had an anger problem his whole life. Right, he kills an Egyptian. He breaks the first set of the Ten Commandments. He strikes the rock instead of speaking. I mean, actually, Moses struggled with unrighteous anger his whole life. There was grace, and he grew in it. Rahab was a prostitute. Solomon was a womanizer. And we don't have time to talk about the 12 disciples, okay? They were all a mess. It's like God, God chooses these people that we would otherwise not choose. Look what it says here. Verse 13, then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. God in front, this is the first of three anointings. It's the first private anointing just with David's family. And it's God's way to say to David, it's, it's a picture of radical grace. It's a picture of what happens to every person when they come to Christ. God says, I choose you. David didn't do anything to earn this. I love what Charles Spurgeon said. Charles Spurgeon said, I'm, God, I'm glad God chose me before I was born because he would have never chose me afterwards. Isn't that great? It's this powerful picture of choosing. And it reminded me of a show I saw years ago. I don't know if anyone here has ever seen the show, Extreme Makeover Weight Loss Edition. Okay? If you want to cry for an hour, watch that show. Okay? 
And what, what happens in the show is, oh, these, I don't know how else to call them, these people who are morbidly obese, 400 pounds or more, they write in to this guy named Chris, and he's a personal trainer who specializes in helping morbidly obese people lose a lot of weight in a year. Like, I'm talking someone may lose 150, 200 pounds in a year. So all these people want, so they write letters, like, you know, here's, here's my story and all this, and every year, Chris just chooses one person because it's a full immersive experience. So he gets maybe thousands of letters. And eventually when he picks someone, so say this guy named Tim, say, say he's gonna pick Tim. When he finally picks Tim, he calls Tim's family. And he says, I wanna know, I wanna visit Tim in the environment in which he's getting fat. Which is actually a powerful picture of the gospel. I wanna visit him where he's stuck in his sin. And so they're always like, well, you know, he's gonna be at the donut shop. He goes there every morning and he gets a couple donuts before he goes to work. And he goes, then I'm going there. And what's amazing is he shows up in their life. And it's a moving scene. You've got to Google it and watch it sometimes. He does this every year. He shows up in their life there somewhere and they see him. And they know who he is. And then he looks at him and he goes, I choose you. And they just start crying. And he said, we're leaving tonight. And he takes them on a plane and he begins to invest in them for a year. It's like, dude, it's like the, the, the illustration falls apart because we didn't even write God the letters. <laughs> it's just, it's a powerful picture that God says, I choose you. And then it says here, you know, David is given a heart. It says he has a heart that's after God and he's given the spirit. Guess what? We can have the same heart that David has because it's the, it's the heart of flesh that the, the, the prophet Jeremiah tells us every Christian gets when they trust Christ. When you become a Christian, God removes, he calls it your heart of stone, and he gives you a heart of flesh. And then he gives you the person of the Holy Spirit. See, there it says the Spirit rushed upon him. In the Old Testament, the Spirit is upon you. In the New Testament, the Spirit is inside of you. That God gives us a new heart, and God gives us a new power. And this is the moment where, where David is going from being tomorrow's man to begin to be today's man. I want you to see what happens. If you look at the end of verse 13, it says this. And Samuel rose up, and he went to Ramah. Now, this is amazing because this is the second to last mention of Samuel. If you're reading the books, it's Samuel, it's Samuel, it's Samuel, it's Samuel, it's Samuel and Saul, it's Samuel and Saul, it's Samuel, Samuel, now it's Samuel and David, now Samuel's gone. He goes to Ramah. He's only gonna be mentioned one more time. Samuel is mentioned, you can go there if you want to at another time. He's mentioned in 1 Samuel 19. And what happens is David is... Remember, I told you there's about 20 years where David is anointed but not yet the king. And, and Saul is really making it hard on David. And so David, as tomorrow's man, somehow he knows where Samuel is. He goes and visits today's man and says, will you help me? What a powerful picture. I am tomorrow's man. Things are not going how I, need, how I thought they were going to go. And I need today's man to help me out. And that's exactly what Samuel does for him. And then in chapter 25, Samuel dies and there's a small funeral for him. And that's the end of Samuel. And, and what I want to do today is I just want to ask you, I told you I was going to do this, I just want to ask you, are you yesterday's man or woman? Are you today's man? Or are you tomorrow's man? And I, and I told you, and I mean it, to be yesterday's man is a choice. It's a choice. Some of you are making that choice with the decisions that you are making. The way that you become yesterday's man is through constant and consistent compromise and an unwillingness to repent. Last night after the service, I was talking to a lady outside and I, you know, I asked the same questions all the time. Why'd you come? Why'd you come back? And she said something very interesting after this message. She goes, you know what? We realized actually, she said, this is kind of weird. She said, we realized we were a part of yesterday's church. I thought, wow, <laughs> new thought. I guess if there can be yesterday's man, there can be yesterday's church filled with yesterday's men and women. You know, part of why Saul could never get there is he could never rejoice in David. He could never rejoice in the next generation. This is, by the way, why churches get stuck all the time. It's all about me. It's all about what I need. It's not about the next generation. Today's man thinks about the next generation. But I want to tell you, there's some of you, there's others of you who you feel like you're yesterday's man or woman, right? It's like you meet people like this. It's like, it's my divorce, it's, it's what I did financially. It was a long time ago, but it was really bad. It's like something in your past. It's like, listen, the only way people stay yesterday's men and women is because they won't repent. 
As soon as you say, God, I want to do the right thing, will you help me? Here's the good news. You can walk in here yesterday's men and women, and you can leave here today, men and women. That's the power of the gospel. Other, most of us in this room, we need to be today's men and women. In fact, I'm going to do something else. If you're 30 or older, stand up, please. Don't be afraid. Stand up. There's lots of you in this room. Okay, listen. You are today's men and women. We need you. Some of you feel like you're too young. Some of you feel like you're too old, right? It's like, well, when were you the right age? Was there just one day where you're like, this is it? No, it's like, listen, we need you. We need you to invest in the men and women of tomorrow today. We need you to be husbands and fathers and mothers and wives. And we just want to say, thank you. We believe in you. You may be seated. I wanted you to see that. Now, if you're under 30, stand up. Stand up if you're under 30. Look at this church, guys. Men and women, you are the men and women of tomorrow. We love you. And here's what the scripture says. The scripture says this, do not give your strength and your youth to evil things. We live in a culture where people don't think they're ever going to get older than 40. And they make a bunch of foolish decisions and then they have a midlife crisis. And they climb a ladder and then they realize it was leaning against the wrong wall. And we just wanna tell you that we love you, we're here for you, we're praying for you, and what this church wants to do is connect today's men and women to you guys because you will one day be who you're now becoming. You may be seated. Guys, how we're gonna end is we're gonna sing a song together. And the song is called Same God and we're, David's mentioned in it, a lot of people from the Old Testament and New Testament are mentioned in it. And here's the whole idea. We have the same God of, as David. No, we're not a king. No, we're not getting written about in the Bible, but we have the exact same God. And here's what it means. If you have the same God, it means that you can be a different person because that's what God does. What God has done in men's lives in changing hearts and giving the Holy Spirit, what he did, he is still doing. And so I'm gonna pray for us and then let's stand and let's sing together to our great God and King. Pray with me. Lord, I just wanna give a moment for these men and women if they feel like for some reason they're yesterday's men and women, that they would receive the grace of God in their life. Lord, we, it's part of being human is that we cannot control the future and we cannot change the past. And there are things that all of us are ashamed of that we've done in the past. And some of them are more grievous than others, Lord. And some of them mark our conscience, Lord. And I just pray that you would just speak over anyone here. If they're not dead, Lord, you're not done with them and that they would experience grace and repentance. Lord, I pray for anyone who's on the slippery slope of becoming yesterday's men and women through consistent compromise. Lord, I pray for repentance. Lord, we pray for today's men and women, Lord, that they would embrace what you're doing. We don't have tomorrow's men and women if today's men and women don't invest in them. Lord, and we pray for the next generation. Lord, we know that you care about every generation, but especially the next, Lord. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.